Hello, everyone. My name is Frédéric Michard. I'm from Lausanne, Switzerland. I thank you very much for your invitation. So before I start, I'd just like to disclose the fact that I'm uh, leading today a consulting and research company based in Switzerland, where we focus on uh, digital innovations with medical applications. So pulse oximetry, you know pulse oximetry was invented by Mr. Taku Aoyagi, who sadly passed away uh, a few weeks ago. And pulse oximetry is used everywhere beyond the OR and the ACU, mainly to monitor oxygen saturation, but we can also use it uh, to monitor pulse rate, uh, to monitor the peripheral perfusion index, to monitor the place variability index, which is simply a quantification of the respiratory swings in the pulse oximetry waveform, or to track changes in hemoglobin. So clearly, uh, during the next 11 minutes, I don't have time to describe in details all these uh, applications. I'm just going to focus on new applications uh, with COVID-19 patients in mind. So first of all, home monitoring. I don't know what I would find if I was looking into your personal uh, medical cabinet, probably a thermometer, uh, very likely a brachial cuff that you can possibly connect uh, to your smartphone. I'm not sure I would find a pulse oximeter. And, and that would be a paradox because today it's very easy to, to buy one, to find one. And that's an example of what you can find uh, on, in Switzerland uh, if you look for a pulse oximeter or something. In patients who are testing positive for the new coronavirus, it may actually be very useful uh, to do self-monitoring from home to check your oxygen saturation to know when to go to the hospital. For patients who are unable to do that by themselves, there are a few initiatives, particularly in the US, where they offer a remote monitoring solution uh, to patients who tested positive. So patients who are uh, equipped with a pulse oximeter that is connected to their smartphone, and the smartphone is connected via Wi-Fi to a common center or a central station so that technicians uh, can inform patients in case of deterioration or inform clinicians, and then patients may uh, act accordingly. Continuous monitoring of uh, oxygen saturation on the, on the world is also on the rise. Uh, if you have in mind uh, the way we monitor patients today on the wards, uh, nurses are usually doing spot check every four to six to eight hours, uh, depending on the clinical situations and of course on their habits. And because of the intermittent nature of these uh, spot check, they very often miss uh, adverse events. And in this uh, study published a few years ago by the team of uh, Andrea Kors and Dan Sessler from the Cleveland Clinic, they showed that in their own institution, uh, nurses are missing 90% of hypoxemic events uh, when they do spot check of SVO2 away foreigners. So there are studies showing continuous monitoring of SPO2 and pulse rate with a pulse oximeter may have value. That's a very well-known study from Andreas Stenzer that was published uh, several years ago in anesthesiology. They used the system in orthopedic patients and they showed that in the unit where they did the implementation, they observed a significant decrease in the number of rescue events. Uh, in contrast, in the control units, unit number one and unit number two, uh, did not observe any uh, improvement. Uh, this effect was associated with a significant decrease in the number of ICU transfer, and it makes sense to believe that if you can detect clinical deterioration at the early stage, uh, you can act and prevent, if not all, at least some ICU admissions. So this study was done with a wired system, uh, but now there are actually wireless sensors that you can use for uh, monitoring patients in the world, patients who may leave their bed or even their room. SpO2 can be monitored on the world as well and used as an input variable for closed-loop system uh, delivering oxygen automatically. You know, such systems are now available. Uh, this is an example in a COVID-19 patient. So at the top, uh, you see uh, SpO2. So uh, you actually set or decide what will be the target. In that case, you see the target was 90% plus or minus uh, 2.5. So you see the limit or the targets is, uh, is visible. It's between the two green dotted line. And at the bottom, you see that the oxygen flow is actually uh, changing over time uh, according to the SpO2 of your patient. So it's a way we know this system has, uh, has been shown to be useful to uh, increase the time spent within target, but also to decrease the duration of oxygen administration and even the duration of hospital and exhaust. We can use pulse oximeters as well uh, for quantifying the respiratory swings, that is to say the pulsus paradoxus in spontaneous sleep patients. 
you probably know PVI as a surrogate for PPV, for the pulse pressure variation, and as a predictor of fluid responsiveness in patients who are mechanically ventilated patients. In patients who are mechanically ventilated, sorry. But in spontaneously breathing patients, you know the respiratory swing depends actually more on the changes in pleural pressure than on the volume status of your patients. We know that uh, a large PVI is actually an important sign of upper airway obstruction in patients making a significant expiratory effort and then can be used actually to assess the severity of asthma crisis. We could also use PVI to quantify or to assess the inspiratory effort that patients are making in case of acute respiratory failure related to pneumonia or ARDS, for example, uh, related to COVID-19. So I don't know if you have seen this very recent paper published uh, by an Italian group in the Blue Journal. What they did is that in patients with uh, de novo acute respiratory failure, they monitored uh, respiratory changes in esophageal pressure. And they used these measurements as an estimation of the respiratory effort. And they showed that during non-invasive ventilation, in some patients there are no changes in respiratory efforts. In other patients, you observe a significant decrease in respiratory effort. And they showed actually that these trends, these changes in respiratory effort, are very useful to predict the success or the failure of non-invasive ventilation. So that's a very interesting concept. The problem is that in practice, we do not measure esophageal pressure in patients with acute respiratory failure. So we thought with Kirk Shelley uh, from Yale that actually we could use PVI, the quantification of the respiratory swings in the pulse oximetry waveform, to quantify the respiratory efforts of patients with acute respiratory failure and then decide uh, when it's time uh, for a tracheal intubation. Another application is uh, the use of the perfusion index. The perfusion index is very often used uh, as a quality indicator, uh, but it might be useful as well to predict fluid responsiveness, and I'm going to try to show you why. Uh, you know that PPV and PVI may be used to predict fluid responsiveness in mechanically ventilated patients, but not during protective mechanical ventilation, not if you are using a low tidal volume, typically 6 ml per kilogram, as you do in patients with ARDS or in patients with COVID-19. In this specific context, what's recommended to predict fluid responsiveness and then to rationalize fluid administration is to do a passive leg raise maneuver to mimic the effect of fluid administration just by mobilizing uh, the blood from the legs to the abdomen to uh, the heart. The big advantage is that uh, you don't have to give a single drop of fluid, and that's usually what you want to uh, avoid, giving fluid in these patients who have uh, pulmonary edema. And this is what's happening typically in responder, fluid responder patients. During the PLR maneuver, you are going to observe a significant increase in cardiac output, assuming you monitor cardiac output, indicating that if you uh, give subsequently a fluid challenge, the patient will respond by a significant rise in cardiac output. The problem is that in many patients, we do not monitor cardiac output continuously. And so um, we thought that maybe it could be doable with the perfusion index. The perfusion index is the pulsatile component of the pulse oximetry waveform, AC uh, divided by DC, it is measured by most pulse oximeters on the market. It depends on vascular tone and sympathetic activity, and it also depends on blood flow and stroke volume. So assuming that the vascular tone doesn't change over a very short period of time, changes in PI should reflect changes in stroke volume. So this is a study from the group of Jean-Louis Tebou and Xavier Monet showing that you can use changes in PI uh, to uh, predict fluid responsiveness during a passive leg raise maneuver. Uh, this is an example of a patient who is fluid responsive. You see her cardiac index was continuously measured in the study. You see a significant rise during the PLR maneuver. And then in this fluid responder patient, it was followed by a significant rise in cardiac output during volume expansion. And you see that this significant rise in cardiac index during the PLR maneuver was associated with a significant rise in perfusion index from the pulse oximeter. This is a, a different patient who is not fluid responsive, no change in cardiac index during the maneuver, no change in perfusion index during the maneuver. So in this study, they showed the sensitivity and specificity of changes in perfusion index during the PLR maneuver are pretty good to predict fluid responsiveness. 
What we often do as well in patients with acute respiratory failure is uh, to use lung recruitment maneuvers to open the lungs. And Mathieu Bier uh, from Bordeaux was the first to think that we can use these maneuvers, we can assess the hemodynamic of these uh, maneuvers uh, to get information about the fluid responsiveness status of their patients. So Mathieu showed that patients who experience a dramatic decrease in strong volume during the lung recruitment maneuver are fluid responders. In contrast, patients who uh, experience only slight uh, modification in hemodynamics are very often or most of the time non-responders. So in that study, he showed the best cutoff value to differentiate between responders and non-responders is a delta stroke volume of 30%. So you see an example here. Uh, so in blue, you have the stroke volume. In green, you have the peak airway pressure. So you see during uh, the recruitment maneuver, a dramatic increase in airway pressure, a slight decrease in stroke volume. And obviously, this patient was not fluid responder. You see nothing is happening during volume expansion. In contrast, in these patients, we experience a dramatic decrease in stroke volume during the lung recruitment. Uh, this patient was fluid responder, and you see that during volume expansion, stroke volume uh, progressively increased. So we just did the same study with Mathieu using the perfusion index changes, and uh, we actually observed that patients in whom uh, the lung recruitment maneuver does not induce any significant change in perfusion index are fluid non-responders, and so you should not give them CBD. So it's an easy way to predict fluid responsiveness if you are not using a continuous cardiac output management system. In the study, the sensitivity and specificity were pretty high. They were not perfect, but far much better uh, than what you can get from PPV in this specific context, once again, of protective mechanical ventilation low tidal volume. Last but not least, in the future, it may become possible to track changes in blood pressure with a pulse oximeter uh, using machine learning system. Uh, the idea is to uh, feed the system by a large number of pulse oximetry waveform and blood pressure, simultaneous blood pressure measurements at the, at the same time. And then the machine learning system will learn how to recognize specific patterns associated with uh, changes in blood pressure. And so this is what has been done by Patrick Schottker and Yassine Gamry and others from uh, the University Hospital in Lausanne who developed this software and then tested the, the value of this software to detect changes in blood pressure during anesthesia induction, and you think that you see that it worked pretty well. On the left-hand side, you have the changes in systolic pressure. On the right-hand side, you have the changes in mean pressure, and you see the algorithm based on exclusively on pulse oximetry waveform was able uh, to detect pretty well a decrease in blood pressure during anesthesia induction or a rise in blood pressure during the subsequent tracheal intubation. So in conclusion, we can use pulse oximetry from home for ambulatory monitoring, for self-monitoring. It's going to help us to rationalize hospitalization and to trigger hospitalization without any delay in case of uh, clinical deterioration. We can use also pulse oximeters on the world for continuous monitoring for the early detection of clinical deterioration. We can use SpO2 as an input variable for closed-loop system delivering oxygen. And we can use PVI to quantify the respiratory effort of a patient with acute respiratory failure. Of course, in the ICU, we can continue to use a, a pulse oximeter to monitor SpO2, but we can also uh, look at the changes in the perfusion index during preload modifying maneuver, so typically passive leg rising maneuver, or lung recruitment maneuver to predict fluid responsiveness and then guide fluid therapy. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested in the topic, I invite you to read this uh, article I published with Kirk Shelley and Erwan, Sh Erwan Lair uh, just a few weeks ago in Journal of Clinical Monitoring and Computing. Thank you.